Progressivism, Prohibition, and Politics, 1900 to 1920, Chapter 18. When we ended the chapter last time, we stopped right before we got to William Goebbels, so we'll go back and pick him up. I didn't want to do half in one chapter and half in the other chapter. Mr. William Goebbels, born in 1856, died in 1900. He was an unusual politician, as you've discovered from reading, a uh, son of German immigrants. As a matter of fact, he spoke German as a child. He never really had a good, clear speaking voice. He uh, spoke German as a child at home, as I said. And he, when he grew up, he went to the Cincinnati Law School, where he specialized in corporate law and railroad law, and developed a hatred for the railroad monopolies. As far as he was go looking, I mean, you can look at him and tell he, he looks aloof, cool, he didn't like crowds because he had a slight accent and it was so unusual in a state where we prided ourselves on basically fighting for the Confederacy and being in the legal profession, which he was, born in Kentucky, which he was not. Uh, his father had even fought for the Union, but he was very brilliant and he spent a lot of time building up his political uh, buddies, I guess you'd call them. He was bold, he was ambitious, he was audacious, and he did not like compromise at all. But he was a Democrat, and he wanted to help the laborers. He became known as the friend of the common man. And the main thing he wanted to do was control the lobbies, particularly the L and N Railroad. When he was in Covington one day, he uh, met an opponent. We don't know what was said. Uh, he never said. They had a disagreement. They both pulled guns, and Mr. Goebel's shot found the mark. And as your text tells you, uh, the wife of the man went insane very shortly thereafter, uh, whether from grief or from whatever reason, but uh, it makes good copy in a book. Some people called him a killer, some people said he was just defending himself, but witnesses all stated that they both drew their guns at the same time, so that basically Goebel was defending himself, which is not against the law. He was called the Kitten King because he was from Kitten County, and I dearly loved the fact that when he decides he wants to uh, get further and deeper into politics, he since he was in the uh, Kentucky Senate, he was one of the leaders, as a matter of fact, he managed to get together and get passed something called the Goebel Election Law, which basically um, said that if there was a close race in the governor's race, uh, it would be thrown into a commission of so many Democrats and so many Republicans. Of course, you know, they're going to all be Democrats, and he basically was controlling this commission. So he was kind of padding the way so when he ran for election, if it was close, he thought he would be declared the winner. So he did run for governor in 1899 and against a Republican named William Taylor, and the vote was too close to call. So it was thrown under the Goebel election law into this Board of Election Committee, and everyone expected, because it was run by Democrats, that uh, Goebel would be declared the governor, but they declared William Taylor the governor. Well, of course, the democratically elected assembly disagreed, so as most politicians like to do, we have to have an investigation, uh, you know, form a committee, investigate. So Gold was on his way to the Capitol to listen to the debates back and forth when all of a sudden shots ring out and Goebel is hit. And of course you've got the little YouTube that takes you a little bit through uh, the position of where everybody was and shows you the, how he was, where the place was he was shot. He did linger for four days, but meanwhile the assembly declared Taylor was no longer governor, that Goebel was governor. But who shot him, and why did they shoot him? You know, the whole questions have never really been answered to today. But he did die after four days, and Lieutenant uh, J. C. W. Beckham, who was the lieutenant governor, now becomes governor. But because of the confusion, um, the Republicans claiming they had won, Democrats claiming that they had won, uh, the state government comes to a complete halt. Uh, their checks aren't honored; nothing's going on. So they appeal to the Supreme Court to make a decision. Well, Supreme Court rules, you know, there's no federal laws broken, they can't get involved. So Democrats take control. Meanwhile, the former declared governor, William Taylor, flees to Indiana, the best thing he could have done. Caleb Powers, the Secretary of State, was supposed to be the mastermind of the whole deal, and he was arrested. Henry Yetzi was supposed to be an aide to the assassin, he was arrested. James Howard, uh, the supposed assassin, and I say supposed, he was also arrested, and of course there were trials. It took place over a period of eight years, and they would be, they'd take a trial and have it in one place where it's dominated by Democrats, and they'd be found guilty. Then they would, somebody would overturn the conviction, and they'd have another trial somewhere else, but run by Republicans, and they'd be found innocent. It was just absolutely a farce. 
But they finally were convicted and sent to prison. And then in 1916, uh, Yetzi was paroled. In 1919, he was given a full pardon. In 1908, Howard and Powers were actually pardoned. And Powers, once he was pardoned, ran for the United States House of Representatives and won. Now, all three claim to be innocent. And it's one of our great mysteries of Kentucky. Uh, who actually did the killing? We don't know for sure. They all claim to be innocent. We do know that a shot rang out from the Capitol building and the man died. So we have the distinction of having a governor killed during the Civil War and a governor assassinated. Although at the time he was shot, he was not really the governor. And of course, it just enhances our reputation as a state because it's covered in the newspapers and all over the country. And what were the results? Well, of course, Kentucky's violence is reinforced. The Republicans are claiming the election was stolen. And the Democrats, they would wave a white shirt that had supposed blood on it, claiming, you know, it, in the beginning they claimed it was Goebbels' shirt. Later on, it's just kind of a rally around the flagpole, like, remember the Alamo, remember the Maine. Uh, they'd wave a white shirt with blood on it. You remember the bloody shirt. Remember a governor had been assassinated by Republicans. And, of course, it caused any reform efforts to come to a screeching halt. So who is this Mr. Beckham? J.C.W. Beckham. Well, actually, he was, <laughs> looks kind of dorky, doesn't he? He was kind of grandson of a former governor. He was a native of Bardstown. He'd actually served three terms in the Kentucky legis representative and the legislature, and he so he was an experienced politician. He was elected governor, uh, lieutenant governor under Goble, and they called him the boy governor because he was so young, and he looked such a baby face. But he did have a special election where he wanted to be legitimate for him to be the governor. And he did accomplish some things. He wasn't quite as progressive or as pushy as Goble was, but he tried to regulate the insurance companies. He is responsible for having a new state capital built. He expanded the state normal school, which we now call Eastern Kentucky University. He also expanded the uh, Western Kentucky normal school, which we now call Western Kentucky University. Uh, he also managed to get a child labor law passed, and he ran for a full second term. So he did get some things accomplished, but failure during this time frame, we're still having an awful lot of violence going on. We've got something called the Black Patch Wars going on. We still have a lot of people roaming around shooting each other. When he finally left the governorship, he practiced law and then eventually ran for U.S. Senator. And he managed to get two military bases to come to Kentucky, which helped financially. Now, no matter he, how well he had done or what you are or what you want to be, if you want to get elected, you're going to have to have a backing of what they call political bosses. Because the political bosses are local. Uh, they could get out the vote, so to speak, and they would find out, you know, they contact you, how many votes do you need for your boy to win? And before you know it, that number of people would show up to vote. The best known of the political bosses at this time was a William Purcell Dennis. Most of your political bosses, and there are political bosses all over the state, they were Democratic, and a lot of them were Catholic. They operated behind the scenes. They were not elected, but they had the power. And it, it was power that motivated them. They didn't want the money. It was the power. And they would also provide aid to families if you needed. I mean, they were the local go-to person, like your county judges were. They, they were the person you knew. You didn't know who was in Frankfurt, but you could go to your political boss and get some help. And, of course, they always saw that the people who supported them and were their allies, well, they were given positions of power. And, of course, if they were mad at you, oh, that's not good. Because, I mean, starting a rumor, and what's the old expression? If you throw enough mud on the wall, some of it's going to stick, even though the wall is perfectly innocent. And people are very quick to believe negative things. They always say, where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, you know, if enough people say something bad about you, it might be true. And you could be perfectly innocent, but have your reputation totally ruined because of vicious rumors. And they were not above starting rumors. That's why they were called kingmakers. But while this is going on, not only in our state, also throughout the country, we have something called pro prohibition. Uh, progressivism. Uh, it mainly got started because, well, it got started basically with women, uh, upper class women, white and black, and the churches. They looked around at all the evils called by industrialization and decided that we need to do something about it. So the, the basic goal of progressives were to eliminate the evils of industrialization, to get rid of the bad and keep the good, because there was some positive effects. I mean, negative effects like you've got smokestacks in the factories are, you know, tearing up the air, you're, you're digging in the ground to get raw material, so you're raping the land. 
So they're, they're negative, but the positive that it creates jobs, it gets more material out there at a cheaper rate. So I mean, it's a double-edged sword. And different people of these progressives, uh, they like to organize, they like to have committees, and they use educated people. But people who, say in Frankfurt, wanted something, now maybe they wanted business regulation in Frankfurt. Say in Louisville, they didn't mind the business regulations, they wanted to have a state welfare system. And maybe in, in Owensburg, Kentucky, they wanted to work with the lack of morality. So there was no one unified goal. They all had different goals, whatever they wanted for their area. But the problem with these reforms, it required us, the citizens, to accept something called intervention of the government. And the government began to sit into a very positive role in progressivism and reform. So social reform and social control, they're, they're coins of the same thing with different sides. Social reform, basically, uh, I, I've got education to change behavior. Basically, that, that's a very simplified definition. For instance, um, we have a young couple who are not taking care of their children. The children are sick all the time, and the mother's not doing a good job. So we go in and we investigate to see what's wrong with the family, and we decide this because she doesn't have any education. She needs to learn how to cook better and how to give her children baths to make them healthy and to be a good role model. So we basically are educating her to become better and to change the behavior. Now you can also do that on a broader scale, uh, like our public health department now has had this massive campaign against smoking. They're trying to educate us to get us to stop smoking instead of passing a law saying you can't smoke. That social reform is basically allowing you to change your own behavior to make it better but not mandating it. But social control moves into the form of legislating morality. You are passing laws to mandate a change, uh, like you know the 19th Amendment, uh, prohibiting the sale, distribution, and uh, manufacture of alcohol, or passing a law saying you can't quit school until you're 16 years old. That's social control. So reform is basically education. Control is where the government steps in and passes a law to mandate change. And like I said, I've given some examples here. Uh, so for control would be prohibition. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was a rather large women's organization, they were anti-prohibitionist. I mean, they were pro-prohibition. They wanted, they figured that drink was the evil. If a man gets paid on Friday and he stops by a local bar and he gets drunk, he gets home and his wife wants money to pay the rent, the first thing he's going to do is get defensive. And so he kicks the dog, and beats his wife, and hollers at the kids, and goes back to work with a hangover the next day. So as an employer, I'm unhappy because he's hungover and not doing a good job. And if the man would just come straight home from work and not get drunk, then he could give his wife money for the rent and pet the dog and play with the kids and everything would be fine. You go to work the next day, no, not hungover. So it's got to be the alcohol is causing the problem. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union was trying to get a law passed to outlaw alcohol. But the anti-prohibitionists, the ones who are saying, this is Kentucky, I mean, in the home of bourbon, they said the liquor industry brings jobs to the state. And in a lot of places, water quality is so poor, you can't drink the water and you don't want to drink the cow's milk, so alcohol is your only solution. Yuck, yuck. And also, because of unemployment and poor people, the saloons provide not only drink, and beer and whiskey have been pretzels, but they sometimes provide hard-boiled eggs and sandwiches to get you enticed in to drink and eat. But Kentucky, the home of bourbon, out of the 119 counties that we had in 1900, 95 of them were already dry. Meanwhile, we've got this black patch war going on. Now, tobacco had become a salvation crop, especially of central and western Kentucky, but it was called the filthy weed. Now, it was easy to grow, a short growing period, and it usually made good money if the prices were high. But if the prices were low, then of course the farmers go broke. And an American tobacco company plus two overseas companies began to control the market. They had a monopoly. And it had reached the point where you couldn't even sell your tobacco enough to break even. It was costing you more to grow it than it was to, to plant it and harvest it. So it's kind of a grassroots organization took place called the Planters Protective Association, the PPA. And they thought the idea was to hold the tobacco off the market and not even sell it to the American Tobacco Company. But you have to have everybody doing this. And of course, there's going to be some who will sell. I mean, 
it's hard not to sell if your kids are crying because they're hungry. So you figure you sell a little bit. But the people who sold tobacco to them, tobacco company, uh, by the PPA, they were called hillbillies. And they would be visited by a group called the Night Riders. And the Night Riders were nothing more than a version of the KKK. They had, you know, uniforms they wore. They were organized by a man named Dr. David Amos. They were also called the Silent Brigade because they came at night. They were lawless. They, it was a vigilante band. There was no way else you could put it. Like I said, they wore masks. They took oaths. They ran very much like the KKK. They paid dues. And their job was to persuade the farmers to join the PPA. Uh, by persuasion, of course, they would give you warning. They'd throw a bundle of sticks on your porch. If that didn't work, and they'd go out and you'd go out one morning and find your tobacco beds had been destroyed. If that didn't work, you would be beaten, sometimes with a piece of barbed wire, or you could even be killed. Between 1905 and 1909, our state was plagued with violence. And if you're interested, there's many documented cases of the uh, night riders visiting places, even in Owensboro, and destroying uh, beds, uh, burning tobacco barns, people being killed. As some people said, it's a people's war against a monopoly. Well, we're trying to show our ability to stick together, which Kentuckians are not noted for, to prove to this Eastern monopoly, the American Tobacco Company, that we control our own destiny. Others said it's just an illegitimate effort to, well, use a bad situation to gain personal goals. Because all of a sudden it didn't have to be just with tobacco. If I didn't like the way you talked, I didn't like the way you looked, uh, if you were black, uh, there was many numerous cases people being visited who really weren't even in the tobacco business. But violence is just getting totally out of control. Worse than it was right after the Civil War. So we have a governor's election in 1907 and a man called Augustus Wilson is elected. And if you read the description of him personally and politically, uh, huh, I don't think I'd have voted for him. But his solution was to activate the military, the militia, and dispatch detectives throughout and issued the law a uh, statement that anyone who killed a night rider would be given an immediate pardon. So you're just encouraging more violence. So how did it end? Well, the vigilanteism did not end the violence. Actually, it's going to be the United States Supreme Court. A very oppressive national tax on tobacco was removed. And the American Tobacco Company was found guilty of antitrust loss. So, monopoly's over with. And unfortunately, uh, we Kentuckians do not stick together very long. And we, we've had this problem before, we'll have it again. We stick together for the immediate short period of time. Had we continued, we probably would have had higher prices for tobacco. But as soon as the law was removed and tobacco company, or American Tobacco Company was declared, you know, in violation of the antitrust laws, we started dumping tobacco on the market. And of course, supply and demand, the more tobacco, the less money you get. But President, uh, Governor Wilson did make some accomplishments. He, he got some educational reforms pushed through. He got some additional funds for the colleges. He managed to get a small child labor law and established a juvenile court system. He expanded and reinforced the Federal uh, the Food and Drug Act. He even managed to get an eight-hour day for public workers passed, which was good because prior to this time you were working long hours. Progressivism in politics. Oh, well, that's the two words that <laughs> really you don't like to hear very much. But at, at the end of this time, we're starting in Kentucky. We hadn't wanted change after the Civil War. We were beginning to welcome reform. Some things have got to be done. And so wanting reform is going to seem almost respectable. So a man named McCree runs for governor. And he's, one of those is kind of hardy. I think he made the statement in the text that, uh, for instance, if the people of Kentucky are pro-prohibition, I'm for it. If the people of Kentucky are against prohibition, I'm against it. Uh, I think you call him a fence setter. Very hard to pin down. He's the son of a minister. He's a former Confederate. He opposed prohibition personally. And under his governorship, some women were allowed to vote. And there was a Kentucky Illiteracy Commission formed. And the child labor laws were strengthened. As a matter of fact, our last county, making a hold of 120, was named for him. So we're in 1912, and there's a national presidential race. 
And because of this split in the Republican Party and uh, Teddy Roosevelt decided he wanted to run and the Republican Party wanted Taft to run, so the Republican Party splits. So you basically got the Democrats, the Republicans, and a party called the Bull Moose Party headed by Teddy Roosevelt. And it's causing problems because a lot of people like Teddy that didn't like Taft, but they didn't want to vote for the Democrats because to them the Democrats, well, it's smacked of old Confederate Southern Democrats. And of course the African Americans were kind of torn between. So anytime you split a major party, what you do is you open the door for another party to walk in, which is what the Democratic Party did with Woodrow Wilson. Um, the only political experience the man had was he'd been governor of New Jersey. Prior to that, he'd been president at Princeton University. He was an educator. He was a brilliant man as far as that goes, but he also was, reminded me somewhat of Goldwell. He was cool. He was aloof. He was very moralistic. I uh, began each day at the White House with a prayer and a gospel song. But because the Democrats won, the Democrats are now more firmly entrenched than ever here in Kentucky. And that governor, gubernatorial race in 1915, your text calls about, says it was entertaining. And basically politics was entertainment at this point in time. We didn't have, you know, movies, we didn't have TV, we didn't have radio. So the political speeches were very entertaining. And both of the candidates would travel together and apparently the speeches they made were quite entertaining. But the race was too close to call. Uh, A.O. Stanley won by only 471 votes. Although he never mentioned that, he thought it be thought that he won overwhelmingly. <coughs> Excuse me. He did have a few accomplishments. Uh, he got something called the Corrupt Practices Act passed, which it basically said that the uh, railroad couldn't give the politicians free railroad passes. Whoop de doo. He got a state antitrust act passed. He got a state tax commission formed. And they modified the tax structure to shift around the burden of tax on different things. And he agreed that the people should have the right to decide whether we're going to be a wet state or a dry state. So he placed it on the, uh, the ballot. And the people of Kentucky approved prohibition in 1919. Can you believe that? The home of bourbon. And we no longer can drink. But under progressivism, you also do some things to help women and children, and you have race problems. The children, uh, you've got people who are for some child labor laws. They say, we need to protect our future citizens. And those who are against labor laws for children say, it's an individual choice. It should be up to the family. It's a family decision. And so many of the families needed the children's income. 1906, we got a law passed to regulate hours back to only 48-hour week and an 8-hour day for the children, but any law isn't any good unless it's enforced, and there was very lax enforcement. But women, well, we've always known there's been double standard for women, uh, and they were known as helpmates, and of course the Bible, you know, and I've, I've said see page 247, 287, and I'm going to allow me to, if you would, um, in the words of a governor, women are but ministering angels in the quiet loveliness of our home. And under a cult of woman worship, women occupied a rather high moral place, and higher than men, of course. And to involve them in public life would overburden them and destroy their innate superiority. A vote for women, according to one senator, was, I believe women should be remain in her sphere. Her power is greater where it is than it would be in the mire and maelstrom of politics. Um, you're trying to have it both ways. We're going to be a helpmate. And the Bible says we should not be involved. I didn't see anywhere in the Bible I read where we shouldn't be involved, but um, it was very definitely a double standard. The Women's Suffrage Association was formed in Kentucky. The KWSA is formed in 1881. And actually, Susan B. Anthony and Carrie Chapman Catt, the leaders of the movement, did visit Kentucky. But the daughters of the American Revolution were against women's rights. And by women's rights, I'm referring to women voting. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was for their rights. And the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs were for their rights. Uh, so it sounds like we've got a massive movement in Kentucky. But basically, no, this is a very small percentage, a few hundred at all. But we did have discriminatory laws. I mean, discriminatory laws. Uh, you couldn't get a divorce unless you were the offender. If you were the one committing adultery, you could get a divorce. You could work, but your husband collected your wages. You couldn't make contracts, couldn't make wills. And if there was a divorce, your husband got it, and he automatically got custody of the children. Uh, there was just nothing. 
But in 19, 1894, the laws did change, and finally we could collect our own money. But the leaders of the women's organization movement was Laura Clay, who was the daughter, one of the daughters of Cassius Marsilius Clay. He was a first class, pardon the expression, SOB. Uh, he started out as a slave owner, became anti-slave, and worked in Kentucky. Uh, I think we mentioned during the Civil War, he worked outside of Kentucky as a abolitionist. And to repay him for his, I guess you would say, support for the war, he was given a ambassadorship. Uh, that seems to be a good political payoff. And he was sent to Russia as an ambassador. And while he was there, he... Uh, he loved the vodka and the drinking and the parties because the Russians were trying so hard to emulate the royalty and nobility of other Eastern Europe or Western Europe. He had an open affair with a married woman, and because of this affair, she became pregnant. Well, he was recalled to our country, and when he came back, he brought the child with him, which was a boy. Now, he had children. He was married. He had four daughters. He brought the son home and told his wife he wanted her to raise him. And the wife refused. And so he divorces his wife and kicks his wife and four kids out. A terrible divorce. And because of the bad treatment her mother had gotten, Laura and her sisters got really involved in the women's movement. And she even became president of the Kentucky Equal Rights Association and was president for more than 24 years. And they finally split because the CARA wanted a federal law passed and the majority of the other people want probably should be taken care of at state level. Along with Laura Clay, uh, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge. Now, this woman has credentials, you know, you can't beat them. Clay's in her background, Henry Clay, uh, and she married a Breckenridge, and her husband happened to be editor of the Lexington Herald, which always made it good. But she was a younger woman. Uh, if you read the brief bio of her, she had a very bad childhood. I mean, she had polio and, uh, I mean, tuberculosis and lost a leg. She was a very attractive woman, very active woman, but her husband also had this bad habit of having affairs. Now, he knew what she was like, and he knew she was missing a leg when he married her, but because of her social con connections and money, uh, the marriage was consummated, and they never had any children. But she stuck beside him, and she worked hard and became president of KERA. As a matter of fact, she became very close friends with some other progressives in the 20th century in Chicago. Her sister-in-law, and I have never learned how to say that first word, so Sophia Nesepa, I don't know how to say it, but Dr. Breckenridge, which was a uh, sister of her husband, worked to improve the health, especially in eastern Kentucky, and she was one of the first female lawyers. 1912, the General Assembly finally voted and said women could vote on certain issues like school board issues. And they just continued to have failure after failure to get a state amendment passed. But all of a sudden, nationally, there's an amendment proposed for the Constitution to make allow women to vote. And Kentucky ratified the 19th Amendment on January the 6th, 1920. So Kentucky women finally had the right to vote. Now your text is very little, very, very little a space to World War One, And it's not because we don't think World War One is important, but... Kentuckians were much more interested in local politics and affairs in Europe. Uh, it's just so far away. And we didn't have that much coverage in the paper. But when the government, the U.S. government, finally declared war in 1970, and as usual, Kentuckians flocked to, the, you know, we're going to volunteer. Kentuckians are noted for their fighting. And, of course, the biggest problem the government has, and one of the reasons they stayed neutral for so long, was because we have so many immigrants from Germany, immigrants from Ireland, immigrants from England, uh, nobody was born here, of course, in the beginning. So if we were to decide what would our citizens, would our citizens want to become allies with the Germans, who were called the Central Powers, uh, would they want to be allies? Well, the Irish hated the English, so of course they would side with Germany. Uh, but then we have so many English colonists in the beginning, uh, it, it would be difficult. So the thing you had to do was unite the country, and as in any war, uh, even our Gulf Wars, the propaganda starts going big time. Well, we started saying anything German was bad. So, of course, no German could be taught in any schools. And, uh, well, we like our food and we love sauerkraut. And we didn't want to give that up. So we started calling it Liberty Cabbage. Uh, there could be no pretzels on the bars because, well, they're German. Uh, 
and in our symphony orchestras, we couldn't play Bach or Beethoven because they're German composers. Uh, and we passed laws similar to the laws back in, before the revolu after the revolution. Uh, you couldn't criticize the government. Any criticism of the government was seen as being disloyal. So by stirring everything up, we all of a sudden we hate the Germans because of all the propaganda coming out. And one of the results of this war prohibition, of course, was enacted because we didn't want our soldiers, you know, getting drunk. And the red light districts were closed. And for you sweet young things who have no idea what that is, it's just basically the prostitutional era. We had what we call houses of ill repute. And one of the ways that you could tell it was a house of ill repute because it would have a red light at the door. And, of course, we closed those all down because we didn't want our boys uh, getting bad ideas. And we even sent letters to the government of France requesting they close down their brothels so that our boys would not be subject to immorality. But Kentucky became a massive armed training camp and over 125,000 soldiers came through Kentucky to be trained and to go on to fight and a lot of them never came back of course. But we had 84,172 Kentuckians actually fought of that 13,000 plus were African Americans. And this war was the first war we had airplanes, we had machine guns, uh, we had trench warfare. Uh, the trench warfare usually involved three trenches. The first trench would be that where the men were below ground so you couldn't shoot them so good. Second trench would be supplies. The third trench would be where they would stay, kind of staggered. And unfortunately the Germans did a much better job on their trenches. They put seam in them, they made you know bunk beds and they had electricity. But the Allies, knowing it was going to be temporary, the trenches were god-awful. Uh, it would rain and be mud. There would be no way to get the dead bodies out. You'd have rats, you'd have disease, and then gas. This is the first war where gas was used. And once you lob those mustard gas canisters into those trenches, what didn't kill you ruined your lungs. 11, 11, 11. The 11th hour of the 11th month, on the 11th day of 1918, the war was officially over. And our boys start coming home, and we're, we're just not real happy about, I mean, thousands and thousands have died. You know, nothing compared to what died in Europe. But after the war, to add insult to injury, something called the Spanish influenza struck in Kentucky, and over 11,000 soldiers died. And they called it the Spanish Lady. And altogether, 14,000 Kentuckians died. But so, and it's worldwide, 40 million people have died because of this war and this Spanish influenza. So to say that people were discouraged is putting it mildly. War results in Kentucky, of course, the reform spirit is totally gone. You've got more and more women in public campaigns and doing things that they hadn't done before. More women are doing men's jobs. And the men who came back, they came back with no glory. All they had was to talk about the hardships and the death. And of course, so many of our schools have been damaged, uh, not from war itself, but from lack of funds and from pe teachers being taken to go into the military. And the blacks who had served dying for their country to gain freedoms for people that they didn't have came back with a new attitude. And of course, the last thing a southerner wants to see is a black man in the uniform of the United States government or anyone who black who knows how to use a gun. But there were no new freedoms for the blacks. The South did everything they could to eradicate any perceived thought that the blacks may have had. Because the French had treated the blacks like human beings. Some came back, both black and white, eager to go forward into the future and more into the 20th century to make changes, to embrace change. Others came back and wanted to stay the way things used to be. Let's go back a little bit. But in the end, Kentuckians settled down and dismissed the outside world and proceeded to try to ignore something that's going to be called the Red Summer and the Red Scare. So after viewing your YouTubes and reviewing your notes, it's now time to complete your graded assignment questions and your quiz. Our next lesson, and I almost have to apologize for this, chapters 19 and 20, that's a very lengthy two chapters. It talks about the economy and the culture in Kentucky. It's not one of the most interesting chapters we're going to cover, but of course we must cover them. And I will do my best to keep it as brief as possible, but give you the needed information.